Let's begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Again, turning to Mary, our mother, let's ask her to intercede for us and draw her closer to Jesus as we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. Okay, this afternoon, uh, now the next couple of hours that I have, I have two presentations left. Um, in this uh, little series, Easy Prayer for Hard Times. Of course, if it works for hard times, no problem for easy times. In this hour, I'm going to talk about the role of penance and sacrifice, the cross, uh, in this prayer. It's, this is actually, I could say, this is what, uh, in a manner of speaking, separates the men from the boys. Uh, I can talk about a lot of things and a lot of people stay with me. You know, you can talk about all the good things, about praying the rosary, about going to mass, about all the faith and morals, the doctrinal teaching of the church, and good people will stay with you on that. But then when you get to this topic, uh, you begin to lose a lot of people. Uh, why? They get nervous. Uh, as Padre Pio used to say, and, and some other saints too, Jesus gives the biggest share of his cross to his best friends. And of course, in our human weakness, and we're all like that, I'm like that too, hey, I'm right with you. Uh, I'm not any better at this than you are. Uh, we say, well, I, if Jesus gives the biggest share of his cross to his best friends, I hope he doesn't get too chummy with me. <laughs> you know, that, that, we kind of fear suffering. And right, you know, that's understandable. You don't have to go looking for it, by the way. Uh, to be a, a spiritual person, a good Catholic, a holy person even, uh, you don't have to chase suffering. Believe me. It knows where you live. <laughs> it, it, it'll come to you. And, it, you know, if you're not having much of a share in the cross, and you are a very spiritual person, and, well, I wonder why I don't get um, a very much um, sacrifice asked of me. I wonder, wonder why the good Lord doesn't give me a share in his cross. Then, then be more, a little more faithful. You know, live your faith a little more. Pray a little more and fasten your seatbelt. <laughs> Penance, sacrifice, is indispensable for growing in intimacy with Jesus. Um, one of the first things I did when I came back home to the Catholic Church is, and I think the Holy Spirit uh, inspired me in a lot of things from, from the beginning of that reversion, as they call it nowadays, um, to educate me in a hurry, because God had to do a lot with me in a short period of time. Um, and one of the first things he did was I systematically read about 500 lives of the saints. I went through and read 500 books on the lives of the saints. And that gave me a pretty good cross-section of what saints looked like. And I can tell you something. Certain consistent things about them. They all had a deep love for the Blessed Mother. They all were absolutely faithful to the Pope and the magisterium of the church. They were faithful to the authentic teaching of the church. They were not rebels. They were not dissidents, not a one of them. And they'll, they'll, sometimes they like to use St. Catherine of Siena or, or St. Teresa of Avila. 
They're, oh, they, they were, they didn't, you know, they rebelled against, nah, uh, 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 uh. no, they didn't. We, in the first place, we just named two doctors of the church. Um, sometimes they're used in feminist circles. They say, well, Catherine of Siena chastised the Pope. Well, chast uh, Catherine of Siena was a good, strong woman. You know, because, because a, a, a woman is a saint, uh, or a man, e either way, doesn't, either one, uh, doesn't mean uh, that, that, they're, that they're speechless or remain mute in the face of evil. You know, Catherine of Siena told the Holy Father, hey, get out of Avignon and go back to Rome where you belong. But she didn't do it in an arrogant way. She didn't do it uh, as anything less than a faithful daughter of the church. Uh, she was very respectful, very faithful. She loved the Holy Father, loved him. These things are consistent among the saints. And one of the other things is close proximity to the cross of Christ. I, I, I can sum it all up in a few words, really. What I'm doing here is, is, a, is a mini, mini, mini synthesis of my doctoral thesis in dogmatic theology. My doctoral thesis was in, entitled The Theology of the Cross in the Magisterium of John Paul II. Um, you could also call it The Mystery of Suffering in the Teaching of John Paul II. The second, we have a, a series um, that I did when the Holy Father passed away. I, I, I brought it out in honor of him. My doctoral thesis was never available to the general public. It was published at the University of Navarre, and it was on microfilm, uh, but it wasn't published as a popular book to be distributed. It's a, it's a scholarly work. It's an academic work, a little bit heavy, I might say but uh, not, not um, totally uh, impenetrable to an, for an ordinary person. But when the Holy Father died, I wanted to do something to honor him, something in memory of him. So we brought that out in video form. And it's called John Paul II and the Mystery of Suffering. And what it's about, it's really an exposition of this question of why do people suffer? You know, if God is good, why evil? Or you could say, why do bad things happen to good people? You know, that whole theme. That's a mystery. And, 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 number one, you have to understand the cross is a mystery. But the cross is also the sign of our salvation. You can't do without the cross. As we have removed penance and sacrifice, from the church, we have removed power and holiness. Uh, when they try to take Jesus off the cross, now there, there's, uh, I don't have a real problem with, with that. You know, the Carmelite nuns in their room, you know, every one of them in their cell, their, their room, uh, they have a cross. It's not a crucifix. Because then this is a tradition that goes right back to St. Teresa. But they understand what that means. And, and what it reminds them of is that they are to be on the cross with Jesus. But in a manner of speaking, you don't want to try to remove Jesus from the cross. Because there is no salvation, no redemption, if you remove Jesus from the cross. If you try to do that in the church, try to remove the element of sacrifice and penance from the church, from the individual Christian, you remove power. The servant is no better than his master. Jesus said that. The servant's no better, no different than his master. The, where I am, there my servant will be, Jesus says. Where I am, there my servant will be. Well, where is he? Right there, on the cross, where I am there, my servant will be. Don't run from the cross. To run from the cross is to run from Christ. To run from the cross is to run from salvation. 
To run from the cross is to run from the only thing that can really sanctify you, make you holy. But you say, but I don't like suffering. Neither do I. I don't wish it on anybody. Uh, if I had my way, I would wish that you would all have holy, wonderful, beautiful lives with no pain. No physical pain, no physical infirmities, um, no emotional difficulties, no moral struggles. I'd wish everything good for you. I don't want you to suffer. But I understand reality a little bit better than that. And I know that, indeed, there is no other way other than the way of the cross. That's the way Jesus went. Why? Because he chose to. Well, well but why did he choose that way? You know, God because he's God, precisely because he's God, God could redeem an infinity of universes just by willing it. Will it and everybody's saved. Could God do that? Of course he could. He's God. He's all-powerful. Well, then why on earth did he do it the way he did it? I don't know. That's a mystery. But he did do it that way. You can say all kinds of things. You can speculate on all kinds of things, but you know, they often, uh, theologians are notorious for this. Um, they engage sometimes in, um, they mean well, but sometimes they engage in chronic exercises in futility. Uh, throughout the course of history, they ask questions like, well, how many angels can fit on the head of a pin? What? <laughs> Who cares? Angels don't have bodies, you know, they're, they're not physical. They're pure spiritual beings. What do you mean how many can fit? All of them. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they don't have, they don't take up space. All kinds of questions. And they say, well, why did the word become flesh and dwell among us? And then they argue and speculate. Oh, there's a, wait a minute, no speculation, no argument. One reason, the word became flesh and dwelt among us for redemption. The world was in need of a savior. And so why did Jesus, the eternal word, assume a human nature and become like one of us in everything except sin? He had no sin, no sin. He didn't need to expiate for his own sins. He had none. He's God and Son of God. And when he assumed that human nature, it's perfect, absolutely perfect. He took that human nature to the cross. He truly suffered and he truly died. Now there's mystery in this, but it is the doctrine of the faith. It's a, it's a dogma that Jesus, who is a divine person, the subject of action is divine. The eternal word assumed that human nature, and he actually suffered physically, and he suffered emotionally as well, and he died. It is a doctrine of the faith that God is impassable. That word impassable means he can't feel pain. You know, he's perfect. Uh, he, 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 God in his divinity can't suffer. It's impassable. Well, then, how is it a doctrine of the faith that Jesus suffered? Jesus is God, isn't he? Yes, he is. Divine person. How did he suffer? Through his human nature. God suffered and died through his human nature. An amazing statement. God shed his blood on the cross. That may sound like a, a bit of a strange statement, but it's a true statement. It's a true statement. Applying in, well, in theology, 
what we call the communicatio idiomatum, or the communication of idioms, it is perfectly correct, theologically, to say that God shed his blood, that God suffered, that God died. Why? Jesus is God. How did he do that? Through his human nature. Because of that, it has been said by the saints that the angels envy us. The angels who, by their nature, are higher than us. They're smarter than us. They have a, a more acute intelligence than we do. They envy us. What is the one thing? What do they envy us? Well, Jesus assumed a human nature, and it was through that human nature that God atoned for the sins of mankind. He took that human nature to a cross. There's a comforting thought in all of this. A very comforting thought. You know, from the moment of the incarnation, that's where God assumed a human nature. Jesus took on that human nature, became one of us. Humanity and divinity were joined so intimately through the incarnation that you, you can ponder that, meditate on that for the rest of your life and be amazed, be continually consoled that God so loved the world that he sent his only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish in their sins would come to everlasting life. Every moment of our existence, from the moment of conception all the way to the last moment of natural life, that is precious. It's precious. God has given us the gift of life. One of the greatest things we can do with that life is to remain close to Jesus and his cross. Now, when you're young, maybe you didn't have any suffering. You didn't have any physical pain, although, you know, all along the way, you know, myself, I've been, humanly speaking, very fortunate. I have pretty good health, and I always have had. But I've had broken bones, uh, I've been in car accidents. I've been sick. Uh, I've had extreme emotional trauma in my life. I understand uh, what it means, and I sympathize with it, but I've been fortunate. You know, I've never had a heart attack or cancer or no horrible diseases or anything. So compared to some people, I've had an easy life, very very easy. And let, uh, along the way, I've become acquainted, acquainted with physical pain and with emotional pain. And I sympathize with anybody's pain, moral pain. Oh, the, the, the poor sinners, you know, you, 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 you need to have the right attitude towards sin, and the cross can help you. You know, you can look at certain people, you, can, you know, they can make us angry. Well, why, does that, why doesn't that drug addict get it? You know, or why doesn't that murderer get it? Or, they all let it, I hope they get what's coming to them, and why doesn't that prostitute straighten out? Wrong attitude. Oh, I hope they straighten out, too. Sure, that's not wrong. But the right attitude is to look at them and say, except for the grace of God, there go I. And if you had any sensitivity and any acquaintance with the cross, you'd be more inclined to say that. And I know some of you are. You understand that. But I'm going to, let me say that one more time. When you look at somebody and you see somebody that really aggravates you, and you're looking down at them like they're the sinner down in hell, and you're the, the holy person who goes to Mass every day, you know, just forget that right away and say, except for the grace of God, there go I. I'd be a worse prostitute 
than that prostitute. Are you kidding me? Everything I've been given, she's been given nothing. I've been given everything. I had Catholic parents. And if I were in her place, I'd been ten times worse. St. Philip Neri was walking through the streets of Rome one time, and they were leading a horrible criminal to the gallows, murderer. He stopped dead in his tracks, pointed at the man and said, except for the grace of God, there go I, and I guarantee you he meant it. St. Therese, the little flower, was acquainted with a, a really horrible criminal. She didn't know him personally, but she was aware of it from the newspapers and such, uh, named Pranzini, uh, a horrible murderer, an awful person. And St. Therese's great desire of her life was for souls. And, uh, the, uh, and Mother Teresa of Calcutta picked this up later on. But, see, Mother Teresa wanted to be named uh, for St. Therese. But the name was already taken in the missionary order she had gone to. So she had to take Teresa, Teresa of Avila's name. But she really wanted to be na have a name in religion after St. Therese. She was very much uh, taken by the life of St. Therese. And, of course, everybody that knows the missionaries of charity know that in, in every one of their chapels all over the world, on the wall, right next to the crucifix, is written the words, I thirst. I thirst. The words of Jesus from the cross. I thirst. St. Therese said she was driven, consumed by those words. I thirst. What did she thirst for? Not water. Souls. Souls. A burning passion for the salvation of souls. And so it was in, in the lives of the saints. Teresa, Saint, Saint, uh, Mother Teresa, she'll be a saint, don't worry about that. Mother Teresa of Calcutta, same thing. Great thirst for souls. It's what drove them. And what about us? Do we have a thirst for souls? Do we have a thirst to bring souls to Jesus? Does that mean anything to us? Does it mean anything to us, as, as the Blessed Mother said at Fatima, souls fall into hell like snowflakes because there is no one to pray and do penance for them. It is true, absolutely speaking, that God is impassable. God in his divinity can't suffer. Can't. And yet God does suffer. You say, well, that's a contradiction. No, it's not. It's a paradox. And I could give you several university-level courses on the mystery of paradox and what that means. Suffice it to say, God suffers through the humanity of Christ. You remember when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane? How much he suffered, he says he sweat blood. You ever wonder what he was suffering from? Some of the saints said that when he was praying in the garden before he was to enter into the passion, the suffering for the salvation of souls, he saw every soul, every human being that would ever live, all of them from the beginning to the end, from Adam and Eve all the way to the last human being that would ever walk the face of the earth. He saw them all, and he saw their souls, and he saw their sins. And he saw that despite his terrible suffering that he was about to enter into, many would be lost. Souls would be lost. Now imagine... You know, you and I are capable of love. We know that. Now, many of you are mothers and fathers. And you know how much you love your children. I mentioned last night, they, they say that the loss of a child is the greatest suffering 
that a person could go through. Someone asked me to pray. They said some high school students were killed in a terrible car accident. I think five of them or something. Reminded me of my sister. She was killed. She had just turned 14 years old and went to her first football game. You know how it is at home. My, my, my older sister was um, home from college, I think, that weekend. Uh, I was um, working at a place I worked at down in Dutchess County. I was in college at the time. That week, my, my sister, who just hit the ripe old age of 14, um, had been um, badgering my mother about the football game. It was the first game of the season, and she wanted to go, and my mom said, sure. You know, the other kids went. You know, I played. My, my sister went to the game. So, sure, you're in high school now. You, you can go to the game. Well, I'd like to go. I want to go drive with it. Nope. You do what the other kids did. You walk. You walk up. It was at about a mile up to the high school from where we live. But it was, there was no crime at that time. You could walk at night in that area and not be afraid. Nothing would happen. Um, but no, my, but, but this uh, so-and-so, he, he's an older boy. He's going to drive and we're, no. And so it went on all week, you know. You know how, how kids can't take no for an answer? And so it was like a running battle every day, every day. And you know, they're relentless. <laughs> but so was my mother. <laughs> My, she, she, uh, you know, she was old school. She, 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 when she had the mom hat on, which was 24 hours a day, even when she was working in the hospital as a registered nurse, she was mom. And, uh, hey, you know, she knew what she wanted, and she's going to tell you. No, 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 no. It went on and on and on. And then, of course, Friday morning, the day of the game, we've had night games in those days. My sister, again, you know, 6 o'clock in the morning before my mother's getting ready to go to the, I think, the 7 to 3 shift at the hospital. You know, I could hear it from my bedroom. It was, it was taken up again. No. And as my mother was going out the door, she turned and she pointed at my sister and she said, you can go to the game, but don't you dare get in that car. I have a terrible feeling that if you do something awful will happen. Well, she, you know, as kids sometimes do, she went to the game in the car, and then she came home. And out in the roads of Columbia County, the boy driving the car lost control of it, probably trying to show off, going too fast, went off the road, hit a tree, and killed them all. Imagine how much a parent loves that one child. I watched my mother suffer. She had other children. It's not like it was the only one she had. Did it matter? <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. What mattered was the one that was lost. That caused the pain. They called me that night, and I drove up to Hudson and rushed into the hospital. I didn't know if she was alive or dead, but I was figuring, ah, she's a kid, you know, in the course of growing up, you have a lot of bumps and bruises. You have accidents. My mother was always getting called. Uh, I, I was always at, from sports mostly, but, you know, uh, well, um, can we have permission to stitch up his eye? Or he's got a broken leg. He's got a broken arm. And I figured, well, that's one of those deals, you know? And when I walked in the entryway to the, the hospital, my uncle was there, my, my mom's brother, my Uncle Lou. And I knew, I knew that she had died. My mother, being a nurse, had access in the hospital. They stopped her. They, they wouldn't let her in, into the uh, emergency room. Uh, it was a terrible thing. And I watched my mother suffer. Now, we human beings in our imperfection, in our sinfulness, we're capable of love. 
great love. My mother suffered at the loss of her child, and she's never gotten over it. And I'll ask you to pray for my mother right now, since, you know, it's one of my few perks as a priest. I'll just take a second to ask you to pray for my mother, who suffers very much. I have no doubt she suffers for me, my ministry, to help bring grace into it, just as my father had suffered a great deal in his life. My mother still suffers from the loss of that child. Imagine God in his perfection. Suffering. Not just for one child, but for all the wayward children. From the beginning of time to the end. I remember being on the bad side of reality for 20 years of my life. I grew up in a good Catholic family in upstate New York. I have no excuses. See, my family went to Mass every Sunday, made sure their children had all the religious instruction, received all the sacraments. It wasn't my family's fault that I went in the wrong direction as many of us did in those days. You know, it was back in the 60s, I graduated from high school in 1965. And you know, our, our battle cry back in the 60s was, you know, all about freedom. I gotta be free, I gotta be me. And then we ran off like morons <laughs> to Woodstock or wherever else we went. You know, we, we wanted to be our own persons, and nothing has changed. You know, kids, they, they, they can't wait to be free of the parental yoke. You know, and I, and I thought, I love my family, you know. I love my mother and my grandma, but, I, hey, you know, they're old. Hey, you know, religion, they were always after me. Oh, God help us. By the way, my mother was, was, was of the old school when I got to be, you know, 16, 17, 18, I, I was uh, obviously, as Grandma said, too big for my britches. But I thought I could make my own decisions. Uh, church is no longer relevant for me. I remember saying that to my mother one day. I don't find church to be relevant. And she picked up a broom. And <laughs> She said, maybe I can give you some relevance. <laughs> my, yeah, my mother was old school. Now, I'm not encouraging, you know, brutality or, or uh, you know. But part of the reason we have a world that's falling into hell, you know, in a handbasket, so to speak, is because of stupidity. Oh, we must not discipline the children. You know, oh, you can't spank your child. They even tried to pass a law in California that you can't spank your children. You can go to jail if you spank your children. Morons. <laughs> My, you know, I'm sorry. I don't mean to use coarse terminology, but it's true. You know, <laughs> Dr. Spock said we must never discipline our children. You know what happened to Dr. Spock in the end? <laughs> yeah, not good, not good. <laughs> Common sense. Not abuse, not abuse. I was never abused by my parents. My father never abused me, my mother never abused me. The sisters that taught me in school never abused me, but they kicked the hell out of me. <laughs> Literally. Literally. Ah. Oh. Sister Mildred carried a yardstick around, and God help you if you were bad. Literally. You know, and, and some of us were pretty hellacious little critters. Not in that classroom. Oh, no. There was no misbehaving in Sister's classroom. Was, was she abusive? No. She was not. Oh, I thank God for her to this very day, and for all the rest of them, too. 
They weren't abusive. You know, by today's standards, yes. But today's standards are sick and have resulted in a sick society. You know, the, the common sense. The Bible says God chastises every son he loves. And it also says that, you know, a parent who does not, and I'm not encouraging you to beat your children, don't get me wrong, that's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying, be a parent. If you're a mom or a dad, get a backbone. Discipline your children. I can, I can, never, for, I can never forget the story from the life of Padre Pio, St. Pio. He heard confessions a great deal, you know. And one day he was hearing confessions, and a woman came into the uh, confessional. She knelt down, and she didn't even get a chance to say, Bless me, Father. Padre Pio leaped out and chased her out of the confessional. He chased her right out of the church. She came back later that afternoon, very upset, and you can understand why. She said, why did you treat me in such a terrible way? And, you know, other people can't do this. This was a saint that did this. But he said, you know, I'm not encouraging priests to do this, and I would never do it. But she said, Padre Pio said, when you came in and you knelt down, I immediately saw your two sons in hell. The two sons that you never disciplined. The two sons that you didn't have the backbone to raise properly. You let them do whatever they wanted to do. You were a permissive parent. I often make the analogy with some of our bishops and priests. They are like permissive parents. They are good, decent men, you know, but, but they don't want to say no. They don't know how to say no, like some parents. They don't know how to say no to their children. Consequently, their children do whatever they want, and then they wonder when they end up in prison or dead or whatever. There's suffering involved in that. I'm a father. I've had to learn how to say no. I've had to learn how to advise my spiritual children, how to admonish them. You know, it would be much easier for me to never say a contentious word, to never talk about controverted issues, never talk about abortion, never talk about liturgical abuses, uh, never talk about the homosexual question, you know, never bring these things up. You know, in a manner of speaking, my life would be a lot easier because nobody would be attacking me. I wouldn't be getting death threats. You know, I started to tell you about that poor priest that I knew in Milwaukee. He was a very fine priest. He, he, he on his radio program, uh, gave the church's position on homosexuality, and he didn't do it in a mean way. He wasn't a mean-spirited man. You know, he said what I say, you must love all of our brothers and sisters. They found him one morning murdered and caught up in pieces. And the homicide detective who investigated, he was 70-some years old, Father Al Kuntz. And the detective knew who did it. And it was some people who had heard those radio programs and didn't like it. And they were a radical element, not, not the normal kind of folks uh, that, that he was talking to. But that's what happened to him. It would have been a lot easier for, for, for poor Father Al in, in his retirement, in his, in his old age, to not be involved with that, to not bring that upon himself. But he was faithful to the gospel. And if you're faithful to the gospel, sooner or later, you're going to be crucified. You're going to suffer. 
But if you just take your ease and float along and sit on the fence, oh, you can spare yourself a lot of pain and grief. If you just let your kids do whatever they want, you don't have to have the aggravation every day. You know, just sure, let them go. What's the big deal? Everybody's doing it. I used to say that to my grandmother, but grandma, everybody's doing it. And her stock response was, if they jump off a bridge, will you do it? You know, <laughs> so what? Everybody's doing it. If everybody is insane, will you be that way because they are? But it takes a certain amount of courage. And it takes a certain amount of stamina to do what's right. I, I can't take any credit for it in my life, but I'll tell you this. I have never once, I say this before God Almighty, I have never once backed off or backed down from preaching the truth. Never. Never. Not even one time. Ever. And I've been, I've been outright threatened. I've been threatened. Don't you dare. Not by my superiors. I have great superiors in the church. Totally supportive, very wonderful, good holy priest. And I've been fortunate. You know, God brought me to the congregation that he brought me to because the, he knew they would support me and I'd be able to perform my mission. If I were a thousand other places, though, <laughs> I'd be stuck away in a broom closet somewhere. <laughs> or they'd have gotten rid of me long ago. But I can do, my superiors have had telephone calls from bishop after bishop and politician after politician, some of them in very high places. <laughs> By the way, yesterday when I was up here preaching, uh, one of my friends from Ohio who comes and helps out at the tables, he got a phone call on his cell phone, and it was one of his friends in the Secret Service. And he said, ah, Sal, there's somebody who wants to say hello to you here. He said, oh, they got on the phone, and who is it? George W. Bush, the president. And, and, and Sal said, oh, hi, Mr. President, how you doing? He says, yeah, I'm over here in Buffalo with Father Karapi. And, and the president said, oh, yeah, I know him. He never met me, I never met him. But he's seen some of my videos. Wake Up America, especially. He knows about that. Uh, you know, I don't know, but I'll tell you something. Be faithful. Be faithful no matter, be a faithful parent, a, a faithful religious, a faithful priest. Be true to the truth. Don't waver, don't, don't, be weak in the knees. You know, in order to stand, you've got to have a backbone. You know, you can't stand without a spine. That's a fact of physiology, right? You've got to have a backbone to stand. Listen, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for everything. You've got to have a spine. You've got to pray. If you're a person of prayer, if you're close to Jesus and his cross, you'll have courage when you need it. Whether that's in everyday stuff like dealing with your children at the workplace, in your parish, in whatever it is. If I didn't pray, and I'm no great example, I have my defects, lots of them. You know, I'm, believe me, I, I, a lot of people say, oh, they tell my people that, that, that um, work with me, they say, oh, I wish I could have your job. You're so lucky to get to be with Father Karapi. And they laugh. <laughs> oh, they laugh. See, they know my defects. They, they, they're, they're around me all the time. They put up with me. You know, I'm impatient sometimes. I get angry sometimes. I, I shouldn't. I shouldn't. It's not, I'm not bragging about it. But I have my defects, too. I, believe me, I have to go to confession just like you, frequently. Frequently. But I do my job. And you've got to do your job, too. And in order to do that and remain constant, oh, you have to pray. And you have to do penance. 
Yeah, you know, that has gone out of vogue in the church. We used to emphasize that. There was a document that nobody ever heard of by Pope Paul VI after the Second Vatican Council called Penitimini. And it is the definitive contemporary document on penance. I, I alluded to it last night when I talked about Fridays, you know, Fridays remaining a day of penitential observance. In order to, for your prayer to be effective, I talked about disposition. Uh, an essential part of that is, is a spirit of sacrifice. See, if you don't have a certain spirit of sacrifice, you can't love. St. Teresa of Avila used to say, love is the cross, and the cross is love. You love exactly proportional to the amount you're willing to sacrifice. You know, husbands and wives, oh, I love you. I love you. They get married, you know. Um, so every now and then, the a pastor will say, hey, talk to these kids. They're about to get married, and they're clueless. You know, I've, I've recounted this many times before. And, um, you know, my stock presentation, and I don't do it much anymore because I don't have those pastoral situations. I, I'm kind of a specialist now. All I do is preach. I don't do all those other wonderful things that, that priests get to do. But at my stock presentation is, so, you're getting married. That's great. You must be in love. <laughs> well, yeah, Father, you know. Yeah, of course, we're in love. Wonderful. What's love? Remember, don't assume. You know what happens when you assume, right? Love. So that's, that's kind of an easy question, right, a no-brainer. What's love? Well, you know, Father. You know, I actually asked that to a kid in the Bronx one time. He brought the couple in, Joseph and Susie. Well, Joseph, what is love? Ah, uh, you know, Father. <laughs> you know, love. Uh, we we got we got feelings <laughs> for each other. Oh, you got feelings for each other. Well, do you know that feelings can be up? And feelings can be down. And fe hey, if all you got is feelings, you're like a yo-yo, and the de and the devil's going to pull the string. If all you've got is feelings, man, not enough. And then you ask the blushing bride to be, "Well, Susie, what's love?" Oh, you know, Father, we've got chemistry. <laughs> yeah, that can blow up, honey. Love. What is love? And they don't get it. And I said, well, how about this? If you love each other, you desire the highest and best thing for the sake of the beloved. And they can never argue with that. No, that sounds okay. Yeah, fine. If I love you, I desire what's best for you. And I am willing to do anything and everything to get that for you. Well, well what's that? What's best? Well, you know, Father, um, a good job, a house, nice house, children, good, good, you know, um, a doggy. <laughs> That's good. I have three. Fine. What else? What else? And, and, well, what do you mean, what else? What else can there be? How about this? If I love you, and I do, I desire heaven for you. Everything else is baloney. If I love you, I desire heaven and eternal salvation for you. Hey, husbands, if you love your wife, what really matters is heaven. You want her in heaven, and you've got to be do, willing to do anything and everything to get her there. And wives, same thing. If you love your husband, first and foremost, above all else, you have to be willing to do whatever you can to get them to heaven. Children, same thing. Priests, if I love you, I have to be willing to do anything and everything to get you to heaven. Some of you don't want to go. <laughs> You're kicking and screaming the entire way. 
And so I do penance for you. I pray for you. I make little sacrifices for you. St. Therese couldn't make any big penances. She said that. I'm not, I'm incapable. I can't do big penances fast a lot. I can't do that. I'm too little, too weak, sick. I'll do little things. You know, when somebody is not nice to me, I'll smile at them and be kind to them. One of my friends from the old days is, is here at this conference. I don't know if he's still here, but he and his wife and daughter are here. Years ago, when I first started in my ministry, and I was in Hudson for, for summer, one Lent, he said to me, Father, you know, I love chocolate and candies, and I'm going to give that up for Lent, for your ministry. I was very touched by that. I saw him years later. He said, I've never eaten candy all those years and offered that for your ministry. You think that's small? That's not small. That's huge. May not seem like much, but whatever it is, probably I'd be a canonized saint if I gave up pasta. What can I tell you? You know, I like it. But I've cut down. Now I only eat it on Sundays. It's better for my expanding waistline. I went home to Hudson a year or so ago and uh, had dinner with my mom and her friend, um, a, a nice Italian lady, good friend of ours, and... Um, you know, I had gained some weight, and Gloria poked me in the lavanza, and she said, Father, there are going to be lots of relics. <laughs> and I said, Gloria, we are to be a temple of the Holy Spirit. And she said, yes, not a major basilica. So I've been eating less. <laughs> Little things with great love. We, we, we have to do little things with great love, like St. Teresa. Little sacrifice doesn't have to be a big thing. You know, may, maybe you like sweets. That's never been my problem. I don't eat sweets very much. Even when I was a kid, I didn't. No, that'd be no penance for me. But some of you like, you know, and so maybe on Friday, uh, or whatever, it's up to you. You'll say, you know, I'll forego the dessert. And you, you offer that to Jesus. You say, I know it's a little thing. It seems like nothing. But the good God takes those little things because you're, he loves you. You're his child. And, and no matter how little it is, whatever you have, you give it to Jesus. Way back at the beginning of my vocation, I think in a moment of inspiration, the Holy Spirit was very strong one night when I was praying. I was inspired to give everything to Jesus. Every beat of my heart. Every breath I take. Every word I would ever speak. Everything. I give to Jesus Christ through the hands of Mary. Our mother. I'm like St. Therese. I'm not capable of big penances either. You know, I can't fast on bread and water or nothing like some of the saints did for 40 days during Lent. I can't do it. But I, I can do little things. And so can you. And we should have that spirit. You know, we should accept the trials and tribulations that come to us in accordance with our state in life. You know, mom, you know, you, you, you could have maybe a baby at home, and, and it's a lot of work. Um, and you've got to change the diapers, and you've got to feed the little tyke, 
And, you know, and then the little guy decides he's going to stay up all night, every night. And so, you know, there you, you are and dad and you're, and, and you're finding out what sacrifice is, you know. And you know what you do is you offer that with a spirit of joy as much as you can. Offer that to God. My grandmother that I often mention, um, some, she, she did my doctoral thesis before I was one year old. Yeah. My grandmother synthesized my doctoral thesis, which is 333 pages long, years ago in three words, offer it up. <laughs> right? Uh, she used to say that all the time. And, uh, you know, oh, but Grandma, uh, I, I, it's a, I don't want to walk to school in the snow this morning. I, can't, I don't feel too good. Offer it up. Uh, bring out the garbage. Oh, but Grandma, I, I don't want to go out. It's raining in the garden. You know, I've got to go down the steps and out in the alley. I'm back. Offer it up. Grandma, I don't like Brussels sprouts. Offer it up. Eat them. I grew up with that. Three words. Offer it up. That's my doctoral thesis. Really? Oh, yeah. I, I, I spent three years of my life, day and night, read over a thousand books, worked and worked and wrote 330 pages, lived in Europe for three years, in a culture I didn't know, in a language I, I, I didn't know when I arrived there. I could have just written on the paper, you know, at the end when, when, when I was finished, and you have to present your doctoral thesis and defend it before a board of theologians. I could have just scrawled out on a piece of paper three words, offer it up, and handed it to them. <laughs> That's it. That's the thesis, summed up in three words. That's profound Catholic theology. What does it mean? It means unite yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ and him crucified. What it means is there is no greater love but to lay down your life for your friends. It means that to be placed on the cross in Christ is to be set at the pinnacle of human possibilities. It, it, it means that when I am weak, I am strong. It means that I must be lifted up through, with, and in Jesus. Why? To draw all men to him. No pain, no gain. No cross, no crown, no gall, no glory. That's an axiom written in the very fabric of our humanity and our Christianity. Don't run from the cross. Love the cross. Embrace the cross. Listen, I'm like you. I'm scared of it. I'm a chicken. I, I don't go asking for suffering. You don't have to ask for any penances or suffering. They'll find you. Some of us have more than others. Some of us have one kind. Others have another. Some people have no sight. Some people can't hear. Some people can't walk. Some people have cancer. Some people have arthritis. Some people all have all kinds of things. They have emotional suffering. Do you know that Prozac is one of about the most prescribed drug in the Western world? That tells you something about the Western world. Emotional suffering is terribly painful. Oh, it can be worse than physical suffering. I spent one year of my life in a psychiatric hospital with the door locked. One full year of my life. I lived in terrible pain emotional pain for years. I lived on the edge of suicide for years. The devil perched on my shoulder trying to make me go over the edge and I would have if I hadn't been raised in the Catholic faith. The constant 
voice and and you know I never once even attempted it never tried so never, you know why even though I was an irreligious impious bad person never could I do that because my early Catholic upbringing I thought Ooh, you know if I kill myself I could go to hell <laughs> and even though I wasn't living a religious life and I wasn't praying and I wasn't going to church the thought of that held me at bay. <laughs> oh, no, I'm not going to take any chances with that. You know, I might be a bad guy. I might be doing drugs and chasing women and doing every bad thing under the sun, but I ain't going to kill myself. <laughs> Draw the line right there. But I wanted to die so badly for so many years. I remember being homeless in the streets of Los Angeles, absolutely destitute. I had nothing. I had the clothes on my back, no money at all, no place to live, walking through the streets, no place to go. And I wasn't a street person. You know, I, I didn't do well. I didn't play the system. I, I, I didn't, I was too proud to take any, I got food out of dumpsters. I slept in the park, in the bushes. And I remember walking one day, and the pain was so profound. I said, what is this? It was so startling. What is this pain? What is this suffering? I didn't know. And it was black, dark. I could see nothing. No end in sight. Being in a tunnel. No hope. Despair. What is this? I didn't know. Now I know. Now I know. There is no glorious light of Easter morning without the darkness of Good Friday. Good Friday always comes first. It always precedes the glory and the victory of Easter morning. No pain, no gain, no cross, no crown. If Jesus hadn't suffered and died on the cross, there could be no resurrection, there could be no redemption. And so we have to enter in to the passion and the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Accept the little trials and tribulations that come to you. Accept the cross in your life. As you get older and older, I'm not that old, I'm 60, but I'm starting, I don't feel a day over 100. <laughs> Some days anyway. You know, I don't see very well anymore. I can't hear. I'm, I, I, I mean, I'm, I, I can't hear in one ear and I'm deaf in the other one. <laughs> I've got arthritis in a lot of places. I feel like an old car. You know, the parts start falling off and, you know, they got to bring it in and fix this and fix that. And, oh, it needs new tires today. Oh, needs a new transmission. You know, oh, sorry. This fell off, that's sick, that's weak, that's tired, that's worn out. And so we, we kind of limp along like warriors uh, r running through life, wounded as we go along, physical, emotional, moral, and we're tired and we're afraid of suffering, normal, natural. Don't worry about it. Press on. Press on toward the finish line. Fight the good fight. Every one of us, do the best you can. Offer it up. Don't be afraid. Penance and sacrifice involves love, authentic love. And when you come to the end of your life, remember that that degree of self-sacrificing love that you attain will determine the degree of glory in heaven, 
It's worth it. Trust me. It's worth it. It's going to be over. Just like that. Take a deep breath. Press on. Be resolved to offer your sacrifices, whatever it is, whatever it is in life. When we get older and older, our potential increases. I remember my grandmother, a very active woman in the church, took care of the parish. She and my Aunt Mary took care of the parish for years, years, 50 years, 60 years. Cooked for the priest, cleaned the rectory and the church, Aunt Mary was the organist, the soloist in the choir, chief catechist. And they did it every day. Then they got old, and then they ended up in a nursing home in their 90s. And I remember they look at my, my grandma, oh, poor Angelina. She can't do anything anymore. And all, all she did, she had a rosary in her hand, 24 hours a day, praying and praying and praying. And, and I'd go to visit her, and she'd say, look around and she'd say, look at all these old people. <laughs> she was the oldest one in the joint. And the nurses would say, your grandmother doesn't sleep. She has to take so much medication. She's up all night, all night long. She's praying that rosary. Every day, every day, every day. And they said, poor Angelina, she can't do anything anymore. Meanwhile, she had emptied purgatory 18 times. It is when I am weak that I am strong. It is through weakness that God's mighty power is perfected, St. Paul says. So don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. We're getting old. We're not as strong as we used to be. Oh, you can't see so good. You can't hear so good. You can't walk so good. You got aches here and you got pains there. Maybe you have cancer. It's, it's progressing. It's spreading. All right, take your medicine, do what the doctor says, and I, I'll pray for you, and I hope you get healed. But if you don't, don't, don't panic. Know that every bit of your pain, every bit of your suffering, every bit of your life is filled with power because you belong to Jesus, and he belongs to you. And I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. And so, hang in there. Persevere. Be a person of sacrificial love. And I promise you, it'll be over soon. It won't last that long. And when you breathe your last, you'll open your eyes and there will be Jesus in all of his glory. And you'll hear him say to you, well done. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Now, at last, Enter into the joy of your master's house. God love you.